In these southern Appalachian mountains, a culture has been long growing for 200 and more years. It's becoming more and more important to all of us here in America and indeed to people all over the world. Most of it know it through the music of Nashville, the country music, but it, it has deeper roots that go far back into American time. People came bearing strains of the Norse adventurer, of Celtic fantasy, and of the Protestant revolution that helped to free mankind from the old tyrannies of kings and emperors. And in this grand setting, all were influenced by the civilized Cherokee town dwellers who taught them how to grow tobacco and corn and squash and how to play the mouth bow. But the Indians found that there was no end to the pale faces and no end to their greed for land and gold. And so a long and tragic war broke out that drove the Indians west on the Trail of Tears. They marched most of the Cherokees across into Oklahoma and killed lots of women and children, you know, in their marches. Mm -hmm. and Are you proud of your Indian blood? Yes, sir. Definitely. Which music, I think, is a gift from God. And, and I'm proud to be a mountain man, and I'm proud to be a bandit picker. I don't care what you say about it. <laughs> Ray Fairchild is one of the stars of the modern Appalachian folk music revival. His costume and his tunes take us back to the time when these mountains were the southwestern frontier of the United States. a land of promise for Daniel Boone and his people who came pouring in from the impoverished lands of Northwest Europe. The only way in was up the mountain creeks and they drove their oxen right over the big boulders with, I pop my whip, I bring the blood, I make my leaders take the mud. These people didn't have symphonies or choruses, but they were highly artistic. They were great hands at the fiddle, at solo tunes. And they brought with them as their invisible baggage the great ballads of the past. Black is the color of my true love's hand. His face is like some rosy fair. With the prettiest face and the neatest tan. I love the ground whereon he stands. So fare thee well, my own true love. Our time has passed, but I wish you well. Still I hope the day will come when you and I shall be as one. They had the, the great English ballads that are quite the equal of, of uh, the best lyric poets of Elizabethan days. <laughs> Black is the color of my true love's hair. Her cheeks are like the rosy fair, the prettiest eyes and the daintiest hands. I love the ground whereon she stands. A mountain boy. This 70,000 square miles of beautiful tangled green hills allowed uh, this British tradition time to reshape itself. And while it was being cut to pieces by the industrialization of Great Britain, it was finding a new home here, reforming itself, taking on a new, new uh, life on the frontier, uh, life out of the cornfields and out of the whiskey stills and out of the feuds and, and out of the loneliness of, uh, of living and the difficulties of living in a new land. Most people don't understand Americans because they don't know how frightening it, it, it has been to leave home completely and pull up your roots and, and face the wilderness. Raining, it's pouring, the rain is pouring down. I can't have my dine, I'll have no one in town. I'll have no one in town. I'll have no one in town. The times was really hard then, but you can make pretty plenty to eat on the farm. We always had work. From the time I was eight years old, I had to work. 
I'm working sheep plow, hold corn, plow and make everything. There you see me uh, way up in the Smokies. We're about uh, oh, 4,000 feet near Boone, North Carolina. And I'm looking out uh, to go and see Stanley Hicks, who's a member of a, a family that came from Northern Ireland and uh, has just endless amount of stories and ballads and dance traditions. Tradition isn't static, it's growing. And Stanley turns out to tell me a story that he just made up a couple of days before just in anticipation of my coming. I just want to tell you, told you about my catfish didn't mm -hmm. one time. Well, no, you didn't. Didn't? Well, Never me, heard about that. Well, I'll tell you about it. When I went to school uh, back in the old days, you know, and went, and Dad didn't want us to go fishing much, but I slipped off. <laughs> went to the river, you proper crossing yeah, coming right. on. And I caught catching these fish, throwing them out in the bank, and I caught a catfish about that long. Mm -hmm. Laid him up on the bank, he go, cook it, cook it, cook it. Lay there, you know. So I got him and took him on home, and I'd put it in water a while, and then I'd take it down. I got it where he didn't want to stay in water, you know. And I put my little string around his neck, and he'd go along behind me at the school, you know, cook it, cook it, cook it, cook it, lead it to school. Talking catfish. Yeah, and it would, uh, they broke a boulder out in the bridge, you know, where the road went across old stairs and stuff, mm -hmm. and I went across this bridge going to school, and my string got loose, you know. Yeah. And I went back to see what happened to my catfish, and you know what happened? Can't well, guess what happened. It fell right down through that hole where the boulder got broke off and got drowned. <laughs> 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 well, the Hicks generation, and Hicks is a Scots-Irish name, uh, it was all musical, all talent. I'll pawn you my watch. And I'll pawn you my chain, and I'll pawn you my gold diamond ring. Ray and Hicks, who's seven feet tall, or just feet. close to it. You can count the days I'm gone. You can see the train that I leave on. You can hear the whistle blow 100 miles. They used to love to invite a ray to barn racing. They didn't have to have a leg. <laughs> well, Ray uh, is the greatest of all American folktale tellers. And he not only tells uh, the stories of the adventures of Jack, Jack and the Beanstalk, but there are many more stories of that in the tradition. But he, uh, he embellishes them, and they grow under his telling. We haven't got very far to come to the river we come to a river and they was 50 ducks around 50 ducks was a swimming in that river and he said but dad ray i've got to have them and i said how any devil you gonna get them well we got our shoe strings out and felt in our pockets where we'd been around had some other string in our pocket and he tied them together and tied his britchet legs and said i'll swim under there and tie their legs together and they won't know <coughs> And he got under that water and swimmed under there and got them tied together. And when he come up amongst that bunch of ducks, that'd be any quacking and hollering and wound up. And he had all, the whole 50 of them tied up, just wound together. And he, in his, in his britches, when he was standing there talking, his britches went doing that and, and let them out and had 35 pound of fish he'd seen in here while he was under that. <laughs> <laughs> it turned up, <laughs> and he had that gun barrel down between them been in three crooks in. <laughs> and I walked out there, he said, I'm abandoning a crook for each one of them. And said, the bullet goes zig zang, zig zang, <laughs> get all three up. And so he shot, and it blowed the turkey off and hit the squirrel and then the duck, and the blowed the gun up, and the barrel went out, and Jack was knocked down there pretty tore up and unconscious, and then when he got over it, we got down there looking at the barrel, and he'd hit a rabbit or something and killed him. The barrel hadn't, he heard something go, tick, peek, 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 walk down, and the dang hammer was a peck of a wild hog today. 
<laughs> this early American myth captures the delight of hungry pioneers in the game-rich woods they found in America. Hunters from Davy Crockett on have lied about their adventures in the woods, populating them with all sorts of preposterous creatures. Poisonous snakes, which few Britons had ever seen, were a favorite subject. They talked about the hoop snake, which would roll after its victim and try to spear it with its poisonous tail. To my mind, uh, the Hicks family represent, along with many, many other of these uh, fantastic uh, Norse Presbyterian people, a main source of the American imagination. Much also was carried over from Great Britain, like this jumping jack and its jigging step that's still popular in English pubs as well as in the Appalachians today. She won't do. Uh, I just tell it to G there. G. Here you go, man. There you mm -hmm. go. Beginning to get some speed up. Oh. Out of their folk memories, the mountain whittlers carved funny toys like this uh, whammy diddle and wonderful musical instruments like this medieval Swedish dulcimer. He won't come and I won't bother. He ho steadily to take it. She won't come and I won't follow. Funny lines from the harsh early days when mountain girls were raised to fear men and sex and yet often had to marry at 13 and 14. Stanley and his sister remember how oftentimes you had to run the girls down. Yeah, you had to run them down. Uh, yeah, me they run me down. I'd I get them and I'd hit them in the leg with a rock and all this lane or I'd get home. <laughs> you long dress. And, uh, if they didn't step on the dress and fall, you'd never catch them. But if they stepped on the dress and fall, you could overtake them, you know, and that's about the only way you could overtake one is just about as fast as the men was on the foot, you know. I've run a man one down, and I've been scratched all of the, I mean, just scratched all pieces, you know. Just like bobcats and stuff, you scratched all pieces. It takes a little while, though, but you can find mine them pretty good, well, ain't you? They can't figure it out. <laughs> I had a psychologist over at Asheville back a few years ago, and he said he'd prescribe them some of his patients. I don't know what good it would do. <laughs> Stanley tied these numerous toys that were hand-carved with a pocket knife, like the whammy diddle, right out of the available woods, to the father's desire to make his children happy. And to to an extent to make up to them for the for the severity of discipline in these families. I'd have to climb up and sure put my bread down, climb and sure to wash the dishes, not get to put soda in the bread, and they'd about kill me over there. <laughs> okay, we had a hard time there. We had to make shoes for the children to wear the little ones out of tablecloth and overhaul. But these same parents made you all kinds of things to play with, too, didn't they? Oh, I mean, he did, but I never did get time to play the rest of them. <laughs> and he's off hard on us. So a lot of times was around the house. You know, he had a straight razor and a strop. And he weighted his uh, razor on this strop that way. And a lot of times he used that on us, but every one he had in his hands, if he got mad and when it doesn't suit him, that's what he used. The discipline was Dickensian. They all looked back at it with a grin, but uh, it, of course, buried damage uh, deep in their psyches, and it comes out in many ways in the songs. Hang your head, Tom Dooley. Oh, it's hang your head and cry. Kill little Laurie Foster. Poor boy, you're bound to die. I met her on the mountain, there I took her life, met her on the hillside, and I stopped her with my knife.
so tang hit Tom do. Well, this is about as close as one ever gets to the real source of things. This is the Tom Dooley sung by the son of the man who actually gave it to the world. This is Frank Prophet Jr., who lives uh, in the high mountains near Boone, North Carolina. This time and it was his father, Frank Prophet, who sang it for my friends, the Warners, when they came down into the mountains ballad hunting back in 1938. I learned it from the Warners, and I sang it all over the country and on my radio shows, and it got to be known that way, and then sometime later on, the Kingston Trio picked it up, and it's now a world song. This time tomorrow, reckon where I'll be, in a lonesome valley, hanging on a white oak tree. This is a story from uh, the day of Tom Dula's uh, execution, May 2nd, 1868. Now, um, the song uh, is a record of a true event. Um, Tom Dula was a wild young buck, veteran of the uh, Civil War. He was going with uh, two or three women at the same time, and uh, one of them, it said, uh, Laura Foster, gave him syphilis, and he, which he inadvertently passed on to another of the women named Ann Melton, whom he was much closer to, and she. When she found that out, she insisted that they murder Laura Foster in vengeance. Hang your head, Tom Dooley, oh, hang your head and cry. Hang your head, Tom Dooley, poor boy, you're bound to die. He took it, he's done it himself, but now, according to what I hear the kid, he didn't, the other woman's went down it. But he, Tom Dooley really didn't kill her. So he took Ralph on himself, what my grandpa and my grandma always told us. Spanish? Was he going with both of them yeah, and uh, had them both, both in front? Yeah, he's going both at the same time. Yeah. I mean, he was with them both at different times. He uh, had them both pregnant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And him and Ann Melton killed her. Yeah, you know, that's what I heard. Ann Melton, Ann Melton was married, already married. He's married. already James married. He's already married. James Melton. Yeah. She was a foster. I think she's Laura's first cousin. Yeah. That's she, what we hear from as kids, you know, growing so, up. You see the women framed it. I don't think <laughs> none of them out there had the morals of an alley cat. <laughs> There's very little morals in, in any of them when, when restraint with any of the uh, but I things. Guess, uh, I'd say Frank's got it about the belt. But it's different stories of it, you know. It's, it's strange for the prophets to think about it. Frank Jr. says it changed his life. and. Here in this book, uh, it says that about Mr. Prophet, who's now dead, the source says, uh, before the folk music started, that is, the royalty started coming into the family, often the family had nothing to eat but potatoes three times a day, and often not enough of those. Gives you an idea of what life was like back in those hills at times. He uh, was at a pretty... Uh low time for him is just uh, all the crops drying up and, and, uh, and then it came a big spring freshet of uh, rain storm and thunderstorm and washed everything away and he just didn't have see no way to turn but he got his delsmore out and got a little solace on it to soothe his uh, depression if he hadn't had that turn to I don't know what he done my grandfather Nathan Hicks came over his cabbage patch had been washed away, and he came over, and him and Daddy played their misery out. Played their misery out, that's what they do. And uh, he wrote this song then, and I'm gonna do it try here now, called Poor Man. Down on my knees for rain, I thought I'd pray. Long come a great big flood and washed everything away. There ain't a thing for a poor man in this world.
Well, I work through the summertime and I work through the fall. Then I spent my Christmas in a pair of overhauls. They ain't a thing for a poor man in this world. Lord have mercy. These hills were rich with Indian corn, but the market was far off over the mountains oftentimes, and so the mountain man had to turn his corn into whiskey and transport it to town in liquid form. At harvest time, the neighbors gathered in to help, and the men shocked away like fury. For every time you found a red ear, you got to kiss your favorite girl, and somewhere down in that pile, there was a fine jug of mountain moonshine. I get drunk. They had to do something, make a little money, you know. They couldn't, they couldn't make enough to eat that on the farm. They had to make a little whiskey on the side and sell that and buy what, what they needed. They didn't write it. My granddaddy, he made brandy, but he had to block part of his to make any money. Mm. He, took, he said it took four bushels of apples to make one gallon of brandy, and if he gave 12 and a half cents a bushel for them apples, that was 48 cents. It cost him besides the work, and then he had to pay a dollar and 10 cents tax on the gallon. Mm -hmm. So he had to, he had to <laughs> blockade it, you know, <laughs> to make any money, slip it out. What does blockading mean? Well, that means, you know, it. Uh, it, they had the moonshine it. They had to hide it out. And when the gators come around, they'd all the send word what time is it coming. They hit out all the whiskey, all the brandy out in the woods. They didn't want them to give a count up. <laughs> had to make it in the morning. <laughs> warfare really took place that lasted until prohibition was repealed. In some counties, the county officials took it very seriously and they just went in with guns and tried to kill whomever they found. And the mountaineers were armed and they fought back. Republicans were in power and they'd come up and cut all the Democrats still and let the Republicans still on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they could come by the old man Dan and run a mill, they come by his mill. Well, we cut another one for you today, Uncle Dan. They called him Uncle Dan. Everybody called him Uncle Dan Barker. And the last time they come by and said that, he said, yeah. I said, Uncle Dan, i will cut some of you all down, too, next time you come back up here. So we put him up another one, and they came back. And he killed, he killed one and shot Tom Brim right through there, right through his lung there. He'd have died if his brother hadn't heard the shooting <coughs> and come over there, turned him over. So he told me and the boss man that I was working on the road with, he showed us where the bullet went in, pulled his shirt off, showed us where to cut it out back there. It didn't go plumb through it. Just moved the skin, all they had to do was just split the skin and it popped out. <laughs> People remember with absolute uh, ecstatic delight the first time they ever heard a fiddle sound. <laughs> this is a, an account from 1870. I have in this book here where a fellow is telling about the first time he ever heard a fiddle, and he, he says, uh, Lordy, I thought that was the prettiest, sweepingest music that I'd ever heard. I wanted to holler and jump up and down. I just couldn't sit, sit still on that log bench when that tune started snaking around the schoolhouse. 
I let out a yell and leapt off that bench and commenced to dance and clog around, and everybody was hollering and laughing. And every time he touched the bow to them strings, hell would break loose in that schoolhouse. <laughs> You see that hand sliding on that string? That doesn't happen in the fiddling of the old country. That's the black tray. And notice how he shakes that middle body of his. I mean, there's another sign of the black influence, because Tommy, you see, grew up where there was lots of contact between black and white music. The source of Tommy's hard-driving, syncopated mountain music is among blacks who handle the fiddle like a rhythm instrument and marry it to the banjo, a sort of strong drum, to create uh, the hoedown tunes that shake the southern dance floors. cousin and he he tried to play a fiddle and he sold 48 packs of seeds and got him a little old premium fiddle, fiddle. premium fiddle mm -hmm. and so he see he wasn't gonna do much with it and he told my mom he said Rosa said that boy keep talking about that fiddle I'm gonna give it to him so I walked over there about five or six miles and got that fiddle my daddy put the strings on it When the railroads came into the mountains at the middle of the uh, 19th century, uh, the work was done by blacks. There was no mercy on those blacks. They drove them hard, and they, they kept up their spirits by singing. When you hear my hammer ringing, wow, steel's running like lead. Steel's running like lead. When you hear my hammer ringing, wham, steel's running like lead, buddy. Wham, steel's running like lead. Wham. And the mountaineers were leaning over the edge of their m mountain uh, and listening and learning about the man who drove the steam drill down and died with a hammer in his hand. Perhaps the greatest of all American folk songs is the, is the Ballad of John Henry. Now, when John Henry was composed and sung by the blacks on the railroads, it really wasn't done as a ballad. Uh, it was a song of um, sexual boasting. John Henry was a steel-driving man, and that song celebrated uh, his sexual prowess. And all blacks, when they listened to it, uh, laughed. And this is what the railroad workers needed. They needed some humor to keep them going. the mountain communities where blacks and whites lived neighbors and swapped favors and stole each other's music.
with the banjo, which is a sort of strong drum, you really began to be able to play rhythm with both, with both hands. This was, of course, a, an instrument of uh, African origin, uh, the banjo, uh, and was given by uh, white musicians the fifth string, so that there was a constant high pinging drone there that was put in between every, every beat. If you don't believe I'm gone, what the train I call on board, I'm 900 miles away from home. influence was all through the whole of Southern music. Southern culture was really a collaboration. Although the blacks were slaves, they came from an area with a culture as at least the equal of that of, of their European masters, and they brought tremendous sophistication. They brought uh, a, a different approach to religion, they brought a whole different way of looking at the relations between people. They had a different sexual system. And, uh, of course, the thing that appealed to everybody the most was their mastery of, of, uh, of rhythm and of music and of, of a sense of life. Hey, he's good. He's good. The old buck dance tradition of black America that fueled the minstrel show and fueled the flatfoot dancing tradition of the mountains is still alive as it used to be. You see the source of flat footing in this foot dragging, sliding, eccentric step style that peppers the dance with hot licks. Between those actual uh, dance mimes, in between, those feet are talking the language of the dance to each other. And what's linking them is this complex body-based kind of polyrhythm that the African dance body style permits you to do, and that you can't do unless your rhythmic impulses are flowing from your middle body. As the whites adopted black style, they adopted to an already very ripened and very sophisticated dance style they had themselves. As you can see here, they're not so fluid in the middle body. They are a little stooped, some of them, and their arms are beginning to have that sort of loose flowing rhythm uh, that the blacks have. And their feet are sliding, and they're getting a lot more syncopation and a lot more tricky rhythms in because of that. They call this mountain dance hall high up in the Smoky Mountains the stomping ground. Cal Edwards, who built the stomping ground, has made his living as a bulldozer operator. He's a community developer, so he decided that since tourists were coming into this area, he would 
make a shrine for dancing. He has dance teams from all over the place, and he himself and his family are all champion, what they call flat footers. which is son dancing here. He's reputed to be one of the world's champion dancers. He's said to know a thousand steps. The Spanish found gold here. Others have taken out semi-precious stones, timber, and endless trains of coal. But the true treasure of these Appalachians are the people and their ballads, like this old one about a hero who slew a monster. Well, the butler made him a wooden knife, look where. Butler made him a wooden knife, swore put an end to the wild boy's life, look where. Quaddle down. Well, the bottler drew his wooden knuckle away. Bottler drew his wooden knife. He put an end to the wild boar's life. Quaddle away. Quam, quaddle down. 91 year old Nimrod Workman loves these old ballads, and they've kept his heart alive during his long, hard life as a coal miner and during the struggles for unionism. Well, I went on the hill at four o'clock. My wife packed my bucket after I was married. Packed my bucket and leave the house at four o'clock on 10, 9, 10, 11 o'clock in the night. I'd come back out and come up back off. And when they paid, if they paid you by the day, they give you $2.80. Who parted to you? It's a mighty long time for the labor and tall down in that coal mine, but down in the dark hole where the bright lights did go, both lungs were broke down. From breathing bad air. Now, the same thing gets in your lungs. That's coal right there. And that coal dust gets in your lungs. No way to get hit out of them lungs. Doctors can't do it. And it's there till you die. And it's killed a million and many one of them. I keep my lungs exercised. For the doctors, they told us. Coal dust didn't get you this way, but it did, and I proved it. They had to trade in the company store. They had to pay fees to the company hospital. And the record shows that uh, the big coal companies paid, over, paid for their hospitals in towns ten times over with the profits they made out of the miners whom they were paying only a pittance to. The, the miners also liked mining. It, 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 it was a life of risk. It, that comes out in the famous uh, Merle Travis song about, uh, I was born one morning when the sun didn't shine. I picked up my shovel and I walked to the mine. I loaded 16 tons of number nine coal and the straw boss hollered, well, damn my soul. He loaded 16 tons and wanted to get another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store, and that was the truth. Nimrod lived through all of that, and uh, he learned what it was like, and he came out of it a fighting union organizer. He said, what do you want, workman? 
I said, I want a raise. He said, what are you doing? What in the hell? He said, you trying to do get a new union? What do you mean? I said, I mean you're paying us two dollars and eighty cents and working us eighteen and twenty hours and we can't just quit the feet of time now. I want to raise. Didn't know what a poor man has to go through with and okay. what his children has to go through with. You went through some dangerous times when Danger. you were actually organizing unions. Yes, you? I did. I went through, through some of them. I didn't know if it was going to get my ears shot off, my eyes shot out, or my brain shot out, or whether I was going to get shot and never know it was shot. I'm going back to old Hart's Creek Mountain. Go on back to that old Blair Mountain Hill. I'm gonna fight for my union. Cause I know it's Mother Jones's will. And I know it's Mother Jones's will. Nimrod's people want a better life with the help of their union, only to face the juggernaut of strip mining that's desecrating this beautiful mountain country. And I'm going to ask you strippers this. Who gave you permission to steal our land, to kill our land, that can't produce? We can't make a living off of our land. Shame on you. Down in the valley, about a mile from me, where the crows no longer cry, there's a great big earth-moving monster machine Stands ten stories high Well, the ground he can eat hits a side He can rip out a hundred tons at a bite He can eat up the grass, it's a fact But he can't put it back The other thing is tourism. And the government buys up land for public parks, doesn't leave the people on it, insists that it's more important for the, that the land be used for recreation for the people from the hot lowlands than uh, the people who inhabit it. And so crowds out the original settlers to make room for an amusement park called the Land of Oz. That, that's the south here, south pinnacles above Banner's Hill, mm -hmm. that they put the Land of Oz on. I went up there and made music one day, and they've got uh, the skeeting outfits up there, and you've got uh, golf courses up there, and they've got a little everything up there that you can mention in what they call the Land of Oz up there. And we used to walk in there and camp in there, and now we can't because they've got it all posted and all. We used to ride the horses through. But me and my nephew went up there and he said, you can't ride through here no more. And I told him, well, just take it and keep it. I said, see, that's where we got our living now. I've got the feeling I wouldn't give that building right there for all their mansion. I don't know what it'll last me or not, but I believe it will. I want to go out with this. I don't want it changed. So, at the ironic end of it all, it seems almost as if the mountaineers are being punished for the extremely ruthless way that they, in their turn, attacked the original inhabitants of the mountains, the Cherokees, one of the blots on American history. And this was done by the mountaineers. So now, uh, in a sense, they're threatened with the same fate from, from the government, from the strip miners, from, the, from tourist industries. But in my trip through the country there, I felt that uh, in spite of all these ironies, all these tragedies, all these conflicts, that uh, there was a, something positive and wonderful was occurring. The mountain people are reshaping their own culture for themselves. They've revived the moribund square dance, ornamented it with fancy stepping, and turned it into a dazzling display of choreography. Their folks turn out in droves to see these performances and watch mom and sis showing off their legs in their mountainy tutus. When I'm out there, I'm in my own little world. I'm just, you Nobody know, just, with nobody's me. with me. I'm, just, I'm hearing everything and I'm listening. But I'm thinking, what am I going to do next now, you know? <laughs> so I love it. Oh, when I hear that music, why, it just makes me want to move my feet. I just get up and go to it. It does me good. I work over there and you're in a, you're in a grind for eight hours. You come out, 
You know you're going to dance that night. You're tired. You think, well, am I going to be able to dance? I'm really had a hard day. But you go out there and you hear that music. As soon as you hit that floor, you forget about what you done eight hours ago. This group has danced in Paris and New York, but their figures are still traditional. You see the very same ones in this Kentucky set filmed 40 years ago, albeit that the dances in Kentucky are a bit more stiff-waisted and less formal. When this new kind of dance style came along, it, it, it arose in the small factory communities and I think represented the, the discipline of the belt line, of the factory, and uh, all the interlocking cogs, both administrative and mechanical, that make industry possible. It also puts women on a par with men when it comes to showing off their fancy flat footing. However, this freestyle dancing is now losing ground among young people who seem to prefer precision clogging in military drill team unison. I don't want something I have to work at, that I have to continuously count and watch and do exactly what someone else does. I, that's too much like work. The huge crowds that applaud the precision cloggers represent the modern passion for spectacles of regimented movement. The new thing is that everybody dances exactly together in a precise way. That didn't used to be true of uh, American square dancing. Everybody's a little bit on their own. Is that the way you were raised to? We practice precision clogging. We, we drill ourselves so that each one does exactly the same movements at exactly the same time. Here, as in scores of other local folk festivals, the Bluegrass Orchestra reigns supreme. Here at last, the British-American tradition has given rise to its own orchestra, a sort of five-piece Dixieland string band, certainly as virtuosic as any gypsy orchestra. And they're playing what I've called mountain music in overdrive.
do an old number here, an old AP Carter number. He recorded it back in 1936 called Foggy Mountain Top. And now we have a bluegrass string ensemble with a wind instrument added, a blues harmonica. Biddles is a bit different from many of the people we've met. He's of Cornish descent, and he's not uptight at all. Here Doodles is in his element at a Georgia rabbit hunt, where instead of guns, he and his friends use the ancient tally-ho hunting stick. Rabbit runs up in the log or anything, you can't, dogs can't get him out of nothing. You can take your stick with a little fork here and twist it in his hair like that, and it'll hold him and you can drag him out of the stump. I've caught as many rabbits doing that as I have anyway. But we survived just, you might say, on our own, just off the land. But that, that the rabbits were important for the meat on the table. Oh, that was all the meat that were on the table. See, there were nothing else. You could, well, birds, something like that. We would eat just regular birds, you know, I mean. It didn't have to be a pottage or a quail or what have you. We just, if he was a bird and had meat on him, we got him, we'd eat him. We'd have bird pies. I could hit, hit a bird. If he got in 50 foot of me, he'd gone. He's mine. So <laughs> I was deadly with a flip. <laughs> I tell you what, I believe with all my heart that a person loves music, he's a better person than one that don't. If music gets in, it gets into my blood, it goes in through me just, just all, and I get the biggest thrill out, a smile on a face when I'm trying to entertain anybody or singing to them, money can't buy it. They say when you die, leave this world, say you don't take nothing with you, but they're so wrong there. They, that's the worst mistake ever. I told them, I said, when you dig my little hole out there, I said, add three foot to it. I said, them memories, it'll take that much to hold my memories. And I said, I'm taking my memories with me. Yeah. 